me, G. Marshall. I have a strange tale to tell you. A tale of murder, of intricate planning, and finally of shocking last-minute surprise. It is a murder so diabolical in its framework that the authorities are forced to act despite the fact that they have serious doubts. A crime perfect in its conception. Perfect in its execution. Sound interesting? A famous writer once said, Vanity dies hard. In some cases, it outlives the man. Listen now to the vanity of a murderer. Our mystery drama, Vanity Dies Hard, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Marion Seldes and Robert Dryden. Michael Marchand considers himself a very successful man. He inherited a considerable sum of money from his family, married the beautiful and talented actress Catherine Kendall, and made a name for himself as a writer of widely read detective novels. Life has been very good to him. He's comfortable, happy, and satisfied. The fact that he is called in by the police quite frequently to apply his deductive talents to the solving of a particularly complex murder also pleases him and bolsters his ego. Nothing in his life has impeded his progress. Nothing has ever cast a shadow over his happiness. And then it happened. Coming! Coming! Kate, what brings you here? I'm sorry, Michael. I know how sacrosanct your studio and your work hours are, but I... I had to talk to you. You sound very serious. I've been wanting to talk to you for some time, Michael. We've hardly seen each other for almost three weeks. You with your rehearsals, me with a deadline for the next novel. Well, we've had a break in rehearsal. I've only got a few minutes. I have to be back. We're opening in Philadelphia in just six days. I wish you'd give up that frantic career and settle down. As your wife? Well, why not? You are my wife, you know. We don't need the money you make. It's my career, Michael. You knew that. Right? Yes, yes, I knew. But I didn't realize it would go on forever. Take up our entire life. It's about our life that I wanted to talk to you. Yes? I don't quite know how to say this. It's difficult. When we were married, you assured me that if I ever wanted to be free... Kate. Kate, what are you saying? Darling, I love Michael, you. Michael, you... there's someone else. I'm leaving you. Kate, please, don't turn away from me. I love you. Doesn't that mean anything you to you? You don't love me. You love yourself. You're possessive. You want me because you can't bear to give up anything you think belongs to you. I'm going to a man who loves me and really needs me. Who? Who is it? Oh, you'll find out soon enough, so I may as well tell you. Raymond Calder. You, you're leaving me for him? That two-bit actor? <laughs> you'll be the laughing stock. Don't say any more, Michael. Oh, yes, I shall say one thing more, and you'd better listen. If you leave me for him... I'll kill you both. You say I'm possessive. You're right. I'm also vindictive. And I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to destroy you both. <laughs> oh, Michael. <laughs> That's really very good. You begin to sound more and more like those cheap, melodramatic detective stories you write. Leave my work out of this. Please forgive me, dear Michael. But actually, I've always thought of your work and you as pompous, almost comical. Your pretensions are ridiculous. <laughs> Very well, Catherine. <laughs> you will see how ridiculous I am. Oh, Michael. Your threats don't frighten me. <laughs> you sound just like the characters you create. <laughs> Okay, Kate, will you take the scene from the top again? 
Does it mean nothing to you that I've given up everything I cherish, everything I ever held dear for you? I told you once if you threw me over, I'd kill you. Do you see this? It's my husband's revolver. You don't think I'll use it, do you? <laughs> do you? Bang! Bang! Uh, no, 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 Kate, shoot the gun you're holding. You gotta get used to the noise. Don't just go bang, bang. Jimmy, I hate the scene. Well, you're awfully good in it. No, I sound phony, and you know it. Can't you get Harold to do a rewrite so that my lover answers me? He just stands there all through my speech. Oh, relax, darling. As soon as you feel an audience out front, you'll find it's right. I hope so. All right, let me do it again. This time I'll fire the pistol. Okay. Oh, uh, but before you do, I've got a telegram for you. A telegram? Why didn't you give it to me? Well, it came in just you starting the scene here. Telegrams are usually important. Oh, dear. Anything serious? I don't know. Oh, why didn't he phone? It just says urgent. You come back to town immediately. Must see you. From your husband? No. It's from Raymond. Uh, now, look, I, I don't want to get mixed up in your affairs, Kate, but we got an opening here in Philadelphia day after tomorrow. You can't just I'll go, go off... I'll go to town tomorrow morning and see what's wrong. And I'll be back in time for dress rehearsal tomorrow night. Well, damn it, I'd like to have you here, Kate. There are tons of notes I want to go over. The trains are sometimes... If you force me to stay, my mind certainly will not be on the performance. Well, call and find out how important it is first. Well, he doesn't have a telephone. He's been out of work for eight months. He lives in some rooming house. Why well, the devil couldn't you have gotten him a phone? You bought him everything else. Now, don't you start on me, Mr. Burton. I'm leaving right now. If you want me back for dress rehearsal, don't try to stop me. Coming. Yes? May I come in, Mr. Calder? Oh, who, who are you? Allow me to introduce myself. I am Michael Marchand. Oh, Catherine's husband. Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I know the name. I'd like to talk with you. Well, I, I don't think we have much to say to each other. Oh, I disagree. After all, haven't you taken my wife. I don't want to discuss Catherine with you. Do you think I'd stand by quietly and do nothing while you... How did you get in here anyway? There's a bell in the front hall. The door has to be buzzed to be opened. Would you have buzzed me in if I'd called from downstairs? <laughs> I most certainly would not. <laughs> you have your answer. I have Kate's keys for the door. I lifted them from her purse. I decided not to give you an excuse to refuse me entrance. Look, if you don't get out, I'll call the landlady or the super and have you put out. I don't think you will, Mr. Calder. You got a gun. Uh, what are you going to do? Do? I just want you to sit still and listen to a tape recording of Kate's voice. It's a rehearsal tape. I made it without her knowledge. I think you'll find it an excellent reproduction. I had the equipment specially made for me in Germany. The quality is lifelike. I defy you to tell the reproduction from the original. Why, why are you doing this? I have reasons. Very good reasons. Which will become apparent very soon. Yeah, I brought my recorder with me. Oh, oh, one other thing. I sent a telegram from your landlady's phone here yesterday. It will appear on her monthly bill. Why? What purpose did you have? Of course, I used your name on the wire. A very important element in my plot. Look, I've had enough of this. I'm not... It was to Catherine. To the woman you love. To the woman I once loved. Surely you can't object to my asking her to come here today? But... But she's in Philadelphia with a show. Not now. In fact, if my planning is right, she's not more than 20 minutes away from here. Why are you doing all this? It's part of my scenario, old boy. All the pieces must fall into place exactly on time. Now, listen to Catherine's voice. Is that all you have to say? Does it mean anything to you that I've given up everything I cherish? Do you have to play so loud? Everything Everyone in the house will hear it. That is my intention, well, Raymond. You... Don't stand there with that tired, bored look on your face. I told you once, if you threw me over, I'll kill you. 
I've stopped the tape. Answer, but don't open the door. Yes? Mr. Calder, what's going on in there? Well, it, nothing, nothing, Mrs. Davis. Nothing? I can hear you all over the house. Well, it, it, it's just a tape recording, Mrs. Davis. A tape recording? It sounds like Catherine Kendall, the actress. Well, it, it's, um, it's a rehearsal tape recording. Miss Kendall made it to help her memorize the part. Oh. Well, turn it down, please. It's too loud. Okay, Mrs. Davis. Now, we'll just wait a second or two till she's gone down the hall. Now. Do you see this? It's my husband's revolver. You don't think I'll use it, do you? <gasps> do you? <laughs> Mr. Marshall, you, you, you shot me. <laughs> right on cue, Mr. Calder. Right on cue. Just as I planned it. <laughs> Coming. Oh, yes? I've got to see Mr. Calder. Oh, well, you could have rung his bell, Miss Kendall. I, I did. I did. There's no answer. No answer? Well, that's strange. Come in. What do you mean, strange? I heard you up there in his room not ten minutes ago. <laughs> you couldn't have... Oh, I'd know your voice anywhere, Miss Kendall. I heard you talking in Mr. Calder's room. Loud, too. Like he was angry. I just got off the train a half an hour ago. A train from Philadelphia. I took a cab. I came here immediately. Well, then how could I have heard you in the room? I... Oh, I know. <laughs> now I remember. Mr. Calder said it was a tape recording of you rehearsing a play. Well, I never made a tape of any rehearsal. No? Well, here's his room. He's not in. Did you see him go out? He could have gone out and I didn't see him. Would you mind if I go in and, and, and wait for him? Oh, why should I? It ain't as if he was a stranger. <sighs> Door's locked. Oh, I, I got a pass key. There you are. You can go right in. Thank you. And when he comes, I'll tell him you're in here. Here, yeah, well, what's this? The keys on the floor. Why, they're your keys, aren't they? It says KK on the holder. Well, they are my keys, but how did they get here? <laughs> I thought I had them in my purse... That's why I had to ring for you. I couldn't find them. Well, no matter. Now you just make yourself Ray. comfortable and... <gasps> Ray! Oh. oh, my darling! Oh, what is it? What... <gasps> oh. What's the matter with him? He's been shot. Call a doctor, please. Hurry! <gasps> it may be too late for a doctor. It... Oh, yeah. He looks dead. <laughs> Evil success feeds on itself and stimulates its own appetite. A man like Michael Marchand is not satisfied with having disposed of the man who came between him and his wife. He wants more. His intention is to entangle his wife in a web of suspicion and fabricated evidence to gain his ultimate objective. Her humiliation, her disgrace, and finally, her destruction. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Everyone knows Michael Marchand as a man of brilliant intellect. What they don't know about him is that he's completely devoid of conscience. A man with such vanity that the slightest slur on his character... The slightest attack on his rights as a husband is a matter to be taken care of with absolute finality. Murder, to him, is a clever game. He can play both sides and play them well. Oh, okay, Mrs. Davis. Now, uh, you mind if we go over your statement just for clarification? Well, no, Sergeant, but I, I, I do have to get back to my house. There's no one there but the super well, and I, I won't keep you here very much longer. Just a few more questions. All right, Sergeant Gentry. Now, how long has Mr. Calder been living at your rooming house? Oh, five or six months. Uh, I got the exact date written down mm -hmm. my account book. Did you know the actress Catherine Kendall? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I've seen her on the stage and in the movies. 
But you asked me that before. Yeah, Why, well, uh, did you know that she was seeing Mr. Calder in your house? Oh, I knew, but I never interfere in the private lives of my tenants. Mm-hmm. She'd been there several times? Oh, yes. Uh, you always had to open the front door for her when she came in? No, no, she had a key. I only opened the door for her once. Yesterday afternoon? No, no, morning. It was about um, 11.45 when she rang the bell. Well, you uh, said just a few minutes ago, I, I have it here in your statement, that you heard her speaking to Mr. Calder in his room in a loud and angry voice. Oh, but she didn't mean it. Well, how could you know? Well, it was a tape, a, a rehearsal tape. You see, sometimes actors and actresses, well, they make a tape of their voices when they're doing a play to learn the night. Mm, I see. How do you know it was a tape recording? Well, you see, I heard this loud, angry voice coming from poor Mr. Calder's room. You recognize Miss Kendall's voice? Oh, yes. Huh? And I called through the door. You didn't enter. Well, Mr. Calder said it was nothing to worry about, the angry voice he meant, that it was just a rehearsal tape. And that Miss Kendall wasn't there? Oh, no, no, he didn't say that she wasn't there. And then you think she was there when the tape was being played? At the time, I did. Something happened to change your mind? Well, it struck me kind of strange that she rang the outside bell ten minutes later, like she'd never been there. I see. Thank you, Mrs. Davis. That will be all for now. All right, Mrs. Kendall, now let's put all the sweet talk to bed. If I'm going to be your attorney, I've got to get down to the problem we face in your case. But I can't see there are any problems, Mr. Drexel. I didn't kill Raymond. I loved him. Well, <laughs> that is hardly a defense. But he was dead when I got there. I found him in his room. Mm -hmm. The door was locked. Mrs. Davis had to let me in with a pass yes, key. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, I know. The door has a latch that can be set and locked even if one doesn't have a key. Meaning? Meaning that one could drop the keys on the floor inside the room and set the latch to lock automatically and, and then leave. Are you insinuating that I did that, Mr. Drexel? No, I am not insinuating anything. I'm just giving you the benefit of my experience about the way the police think. And as my attorney, how do you think? Oh, innocent. Innocent, of course. You don't say that with too much conviction. Uh, you are my client, Miss Kendall. I don't have to put on an act for you. But try to see this from somebody else's point of view. Now, you're a woman, an actress. You're beautiful. Now, this actress has a boyfriend. The boyfriend gets tired of that her. That wasn't the case. That isn't true. Okay, all right, so it's not true. But that's the way the police and the public are going to interpret it. I suppose so. Uh, now about your husband. Did he know about this uh, relationship between you and Raymond? No. Well, well yes, uh, I told him. But when? A day or so before Ray died. How did he take it? The way I expected he would. He blew up. He made all sorts of threatening noises. Oh, he threatened, huh? Oh, it wasn't anything to take seriously. He's a writer, and he... Yes, mystery writer, novels, I know of him. He's also done a considerable special investigative work for the police. Well, that's just publicity for his books. It's also an ego trip. Well, what do you mean? He's got quite a record of wins. Oh, I met him on the Matheson case. I defended Matheson. Your husband working for the D.A. nailed my client with the most brilliant display of detective work I've seen in 25 years. Yes, I remember that case. Uh, too bad, too bad. We can't get him to work for us. Are you mad? Well, it certainly would be a big help. Oh, that's bad news, Kate. What do I say to the backers of the play? Well, you'll have to tell them the truth. The police don't want me to have an out-of-town opening until the grand jury meets and decides whether or not... They... Well, it's ridiculous. It's utterly ridiculous to think you'd do a thing like that. Oh, Jimmy, I can't bear it. Now, Kate, you've got to be strong. I haven't the slightest doubt the real killer will be found and you've got to conserve your strength to fight back hard. Yes. I don't mind telling you whom I suspect in all this. You mean Michael? Is it possible... You know the kind of man he is. And you did tell him about Raymond. He got very melodramatic. He, he threatened to kill us both. Michael? Uh, your husband's a talker, a poser, but definitely not a man of violence. He's always writing about it, investigating it, but he'd never do it. I think he's capable of it. I think he'd commit a violent crime. No. He spends too much time getting rid of his aggressions in his writing. Oh, excuse me. 
Burton here. Oh, yes, Phil. Uh, it's Palmer, our publicity man. He wants to know whether or not you're going to stay with the show. Uh, uh, just a minute, Phil. Uh, Kate's right here with me. Well, what shall I tell him? Well, tell him I'll call him as soon as I know myself. Well, that's not much of an answer. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Phil, she can't possibly know until she hears what the grand jury is going to do. Yeah, if it's going to the grand jury tomorrow, we should get a quick decision. What? Oh, Phil, don't be funny. I'll call you back later. You won't believe this, Kate. You know what he said? He said this whole murder business is a PR man's dream. Do you realize the plot of the play is almost parallel to the actual murder? Just a moment. Well, Mr. D.A., good to see you. It's good to see you, Mike. You know Lieutenant Harvey Gentry, Chief of Homicide? Know him. We're old friends. Worked on several cases together. Well, come in, gentlemen. Ah, you look good, Mike. Well, can I get you something? Drink? Coffee? No, no, thanks, Mike. This isn't exactly a social call. I guessed as much, Alex. Is that the reason you didn't call before you dropped in? Afraid your prime suspect would head for Brazil? <laughs> you are our prime suspect, Mike. I mean, after all, your wife was running off with another man. You had words. You threatened her life and the life of Raymond Calder, the other man. She said that? Uh, yeah, approximately. Uh, in her statement, uh, she said... Uh... Uh, you want me to read it to you, Mike? No, no, no. If she says that, let it stand. Well, isn't that true? Well, you put me in a very awkward position. I was very much in love with Kate. Still am, I guess. I wouldn't make any statement to the district attorney that would contradict her. Did you kill Raymond Calder? Seems to me that if you thought I was the culprit, you'd have been here immediately instead of waiting six days. Uh, you've, uh, you've been watched, Mike. We had men on you almost immediately. And what have you discovered? That you haven't left your flat here since it happened. And you'd like to know why? I haven't left this room for nearly two weeks, gentlemen, because I have a deadline for my novel and my publishers are sitting on my neck. Is that the McCoy, Mike? I have a reservoir of frozen food in the fridge to exist on. And I have this stack of typed pages to prove I was working. Even the day that Catherine gave me the sack. And she came here to tell you? She was standing right where you're standing now. And she gave it to me brisk and cold like a weather report. But you threatened her and the man she was running away with. I don't know. She says I did. Maybe I did. I thought I'd lose my mind. What did you do? I tried to work. I thought I could get my mind off my troubles. Well, when did you leave the apartment? Leave? I just told you I didn't. Oh, I see. You're always the policeman, Harvey. Mm -hmm. Well, just for the record, I didn't leave. If I had wanted to leave, I would have left without anyone seeing me. And come back the same way. Yes. And how did you find out about the murder? I got a call from my agent. He had just heard the whole thing on the news broadcasts. Now, is there anything else on your mind, gentlemen? I've got to get back to work. No, nothing, Mike, except, uh... What? <laughs> I wish we had you working with us. How could I? I don't know. You know, this isn't going to be an easy one. You see, Mike, it points too definitely at Catherine Kendall. It is almost too easy. Understand? Hello? Catherine? Yes? Don't you recognize my voice? It's Michael. I didn't expect to hear it. Goodbye. Now, wait, wait. Don't hang up. Listen to me. I can help you. You? Help me? <sighs> you have a sense of humor, Michael. I'll say that for you. Kate, you're forgetting. I am the injured party. You ran out on me. I don't know how you did it. 
But I'm sure you planned all this, plotted it, like one of your cheap novels. All right. If you take that attitude, there's nothing to be done. Nice talking to you, dear. Wait. Okay, go ahead. What diabolical plot have you hatched now? No plot. The DA, uh, you know, Alex. Yes? He wants me to work with the police on this case. What? I'd call you the prime suspect. I'm completely cleared. That's why he made me the offer. Oh, I just can't believe it. Don't you see how helpful I can be to you if I'm working with them? Look, Michael. You know I'm innocent. You know that out of sheer ego you planned this whole uh, evil charade. And now you're asking me to be grateful to you for future favors? Well, I don't need you. I don't want you. Please stay away from me. Very well. You've given me your answer. I shall feel no compunctions in accepting the assignment from the D.A. It just occurs to me, Michael, that the D.A. hiring you to solve a crime is like hiring the rat to guard the cheese. How uh, come? You wanted to see me, Mr. D.A.? Oh, yes, Lieutenant. I'm expecting Mike Marshall, and I wanted you present. Uh, well, uh, what's the plan of action? Well, as you know, the grand jury voted to indict Catherine Kendall. Yeah. We locking her up? No, she's had bail posted for her by her producer. Bail? For a murder one indictment? I persuaded the judge to go along with her lawyer's request. Convinced him that the bail would aid us in nailing the real killer. Oh. You don't think she did it, huh? <laughs> if she did kill Raymond Calder, it was the greatest job of reverse planning by a murderer I've ever run into. The plot is just too beautiful. She'll be convicted in the shortest murder trial in history. The jury won't even have to leave their seats to bring in a verdict. So what's the problem? We can't lose. It's... It's just too perfect. Ah. Uh, well, then we're right back to Marchand. That's correct. Only one man I know could have worked out all the details so cleverly that there was only one answer. That everything points to Catherine. Well, you're the DA. It's your job to nail the bad ones. I wonder if you know, Lieutenant, that it's also the DA's job to protect the innocent. Now, that's Mike Marchand, Harvey. Stick around. Yes? I have sent Mr. Marchand in. This is the first move in a... Game of chess. Well, Michael, right on time. Come on in. By the way, uh, you a chess player? Michael Marchand is not above suspicion. The DA secretly considers him a prime suspect and wants him nearby where he can watch him. Perhaps the D.A. underestimates the evil intelligence of this man. We can be certain that Michael knows of the D.A.'s suspicions and will find a way to turn them to his own advantage, perhaps even convince him of Catherine's guilt. The pieces to the puzzle are being skillfully slipped into place. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. the first day in court. The drama is unfolding with Michael Marchand as the unseen puppeteer pulling the strings that make the characters move. The district attorney, still not convinced of Catherine's guilt, must nevertheless proceed with the prosecution. Catherine's lawyer, not really convinced of his client's innocence, must nevertheless proceed with her defense. There is a feeling of ambivalence in the courtroom as the prosecution and defense present their opening statements. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it will not be necessary for the prosecution to indulge in appeals to your emotions. We shall leave that to the defense. We have an extremely beautiful woman, a talented actress who is trained to move you to gain your sympathy. Objection, Your Honor. The prosecution is directing the thinking of the jury. I ask the last be stricken from the records. As the uh, attorney for the defendant, 
It is my job to prove to you the charges against Kate Kendall are false. Now, despite all the circumstantial evidence that has been dredged up to convict her, this great lady is innocent of the charges. Now, we will show you that Catherine Kendall is an honest woman. We shall show you that when she realized she could no longer live with the man she married, she went to him and told him so. She didn't hide her love for Raymond Calder in the back streets of her life. She honestly faced up to the decision. How do you think it's going to go, Counselor? You heard the opening remarks. Well, I was a little thrown by that back streets of her life routine. I mean, <laughs> I thought that was laying it on too much. Well, trust me. I know more about jurors than you do. Uh, they like that kind of emotional appeal. It uh, sinks right in. You know, they don't have to think. I wish they would think. I'd have a better chance. Look, Miss Kendall, uh, everyone feels this case is hopeless. Hopeless? Well, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. You know it. I know it. I, I believe it. But do you think the jury is going to believe it? But I... And what's more, do you know that the prosecution has your husband secretly working for them? It doesn't surprise me. He told me he might be. Yes, they think they've got an airtight case against you. Circumstantial. You said that in your opening statement. All they've got is circumstantial evidence. Well, we pretend that circumstantial evidence won't stand up in court, but uh, I can tell you it stands up very well. Many men have been convicted on purely circumstantial evidence. You paint my future in glowing colors, Mr. Drexel. Miss Kendall, will you believe me when I tell you that I do have your best interests at heart? I do. And I would like to give you some advice. The way things look, you'd have a better chance of copying a plea. What? Well, that's legal slang for changing your plea. To guilty? That's right. But I'm not guilty. You have had a better chance with the judge than you have with the jury. Uh, you plead guilty, the jury is dismissed. No. And the ju yes, the no. judge, Judge Murdoch, he's not a bad guy. No. He'll sentence you. No. He'll give you several years. You'll be eligible for parole in three no. or four years. Oh, Mr. Drexel. I don't want to play small legal games. I'm innocent. If I'm going to be pronounced guilty of a crime I didn't commit, could never commit, well, so be it. I don't want any more tricks. Well, we, we still have one discrepancy, Mike, that we haven't been able to clear up. One weak spot in our case. What's that? Catherine got off the train from Philadelphia at 11.12 a.m. She took a cab and arrived at Mrs. Davis' rooming house at around 11.43. Well, what's the problem? Let's say it took her five to ten minutes to get out of the station and catch a cab uptown, and 25 minutes for the cab ride. Twenty-five minutes? That long? Midday traffic. Have you tried it to Mrs. Davis' place from the station? Well, no, but... Well, I have. Three times. I have my timings here. I checked them with the stopwatch. One, 24 minutes and 32 seconds. Then I made it in 23 minutes and 5 seconds. That last one was a slow one, over 27 minutes. Well, then she couldn't have been in the room when Calder was shot. She'd have been in a taxi blocks away from the scene of the crime. You've forgotten one thing. Yes? She could have taken a subway. I did, during the same time periods. My times to the door of Mrs. Davis' house from the station, 8 minutes and 34 seconds, 7 minutes 52 seconds, 9 minutes 10 seconds. Subway, subway, yeah. So she could have done it after all. Now, here's my suggestion. Your questions should be concerned with her arrival at the rooming house. Now, Miss Kendall, let's just go over the statements you made earlier. At what time did you arrive at the rooming house on the morning that Raymond Calder was shot? I believe it was around 11.45. Somewhere around that time. My train got into the station at 11.12. It took me about 30 minutes to get a cab and arrive there. Well, tell me, were you recognized on the street or when you were in the station? No. By the cab driver? No. Well, you're a well-known person. People have seen you on the stage and pictures and television. Oh, when so... I'm traveling, I, I wear dark glasses and a scarf over my head. Oh, and that, uh, that works? 
I'm seldom recognized. Well, I guess that's about all I... Oh, um... Yes, yeah, just one more question. Yes? Ever use the subway? Yes, if I'm in a particular hurry. Wearing the same disguise, the dark glasses and the scarf? Yes, I guess so. And were you in a hurry that morning, Miss Kendall, March 14th, the morning you rushed to your lover's apartment? Well, you went to his room? No. You opened the door with a key? No. You turned the gun on him and shot no. him? No. And then you no. left your keys, you slipped no. out and no. pretended to be entering? No. And Mrs. Davis saw you at the no. front door. No. Objection, Your Honor, objection. Badgering the witness, I asked that the question and all the district attorney's remarks be stricken from the record. Now then, uh, Mrs. Davis, after you heard Miss Kendall angrily screaming at uh, Mr. Calder, what did you do? Objection. All right, I'll rephrase the question. After you heard a woman's voice raised in anger, threatening to kill in Mr. Calder's room, what did you do? I knocked and asked Mr. Calder what was the matter. And he told you? We said that he was playing a rehearsal tape of Miss Kendall. Are you sure that was a tape recording? Oh, yes. Uh, well, not at first. It, it sounded like her. It was so real. I was Miss Kendall there in the room, I mean... I thought she was. It was so real. But you never entered the room to see that it was a tape playing on a machine. No. Mrs. Davis, you didn't know whether Miss Kendall was in the room or not. Is that correct? I never went inside the room at that time, so I don't know. I see. Now, just one more question. Did Ray Calder own a tape recorder? I'm sure he didn't. In the five months or more that he lived in my house, I never saw or heard one before that day. The day you heard, uh, Miss Kendall. That's right. And when you entered the room later after Miss Kendall arrived, did you see a tape recorder in the room? Uh, no. There was no tape recorder anywhere that you could see? None. Thank you, Mrs. Davis. You may have the witness, Mr. Drexel. One question, Mrs. Davis. You know what a tape recorder looks like. Well, I've heard a lot about them, but I, I've never really seen one. Well, then let me tell you that they come in all sizes, from a tiny one that could be carried in one hand to a giant-sized professional one used in recording studios. Oh? No, I never saw one. Then how would you know that there wasn't one in the room right in front of you? Well, when the police came and I told them about the tape recorder, they couldn't find one. Uh, Your Honor, I ask that the last remarks be stricken as non-responsive. Uh, you may step down, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> Jury's been out longer than I thought they'd be. Oh, think she'll get off, Mike? No. No, your case was so strong that Drexel nearly had a nervous breakdown trying to beat it down. I'll give a hundred to one odds the verdict is guilty. Oh, wait a minute, the jury's the jury's returning. We, the jury, find the defendant, Catherine Kendall, guilty of murder. In the first degree. Oh. Your Honor, please, Your Honor, Your Honor, an unusual request. The husband of the defendant, Michael Martian, wishes to make a statement. Go ahead, Mike. The judge nodded yes. Your Honor, Miss Kendall is not guilty. I killed Raymond Calder because he stole my wife. You can come back for me in about uh, ten minutes, God. Nice of you to visit, Alex. I didn't know this was visitor's day. <laughs> it isn't. I'm here because I... I'm a very curious guy. Curious? You never told me why. You gave me all the details about the recording, the tape machine. You explained how you took the keys from Catherine's purse and planted them. The telegram from his phone, the timing of the arrival, everything. Everything except one thing. <laughs> now, now, I suppose you're going to say you suspected me all along. Hmm? Oh, I did. You can ask Lieutenant Gentry. 
I was looking for some little break in your armor, some little mistake. There was none. I don't make mistakes. All right, then. Why did you make that dramatic last-minute confession? It wasn't to save Catherine, Alex. I'd written her off when I found out about Ray Calder. Okay, so you commit the perfect crime and then for no reason you spill it out at the last minute? Why? No reason, Alex. Think it over. Perfect crimes aren't much fun. If I'm the only one to know, whom am I going to show off for? So there you have it. A murderer's vanity. For that one little moment of glory in the courtroom, that one little moment of stunning revelation, Michael Marchand will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Does he ever wonder whether that shocking moment was worth the price? Not at all. To him, it was the crowning moment of his life. I'll be back in a moment. dies hard. In some cases, it outlives the man. In the annals of crime, the Calder case will be long remembered. Men engaged in the pursuit of criminals will speak of it as the perfect crime. And it was perfect in every detail, except one. The killer was a vain man, and his vanity demanded that he be praised for his brilliance. And so Michael Marchand, criminologist, writer, conscienceless murderer, was betrayed and defeated by his own ego. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Marion Seldes, Earl Hammond, Ian Martin, and Mary Jane Higby. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. and beautiful music. This is KIXI AM and FM Seattle.